Welcome, everybody. This is a session um, that was scheduled before as part of the conference, but we had a glitch, so we're doing it now. Um, before we start, I want to acknowledge that I am living and working and playing on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Coast Salish peoples. Um, and we're all, I'm, I'm feeling very lucky to be safely in those territories and worried about others who are, are dealing with challenges. Um, so we're thinking of you all. If anybody wants to put their, you know, greetings from their territories in the chat, please do. And as I say, if you want to put on your screen, if you have the Wi-Fi capability to say hello, that's, it's always nice to see faces. Um, so I'll let Danielle go into more detail about this, but it's basically a session about um, helping people uh, keep their belongings. Um, people, I think probably homeless people and then people um, being evicted, um, but I'm not gonna say too much in case I get, the, get it wrong. Danielle, as all of you, most of you will know anyways, um, is one of the community law program lawyers at CLASS, at Community Legal Assistance Society, works a lot on housing issues, has presented on housing issues at the Provincial Training Conference. And videos of those will be up um, probably by the end of December. Um, but for now, we've got this session. So I'll hand it over to you, Danielle. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lois. Um, like Lois, I too live, work, and play in the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. Thank you all for being here. Um, I do want to extend an apologies to all of you who attempted to be at the original session during the Provincial Training Conference. Uh, the glitch was on my end, so I'm very, very sorry about that. I'm sorry to everyone who showed up, and then I didn't. <laughs> um, but thank you for, for coming today. I hope it didn't inconvenience anyone too much. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate, appreciate you all being here. All right, so as Lois mentioned, this presentation is going to focus mostly on helping clients keep their belongings. Um, I thought a good way to start, you know, as I was thinking about this presentation, I thought about, you know, what does it mean um, for most of our clients who are precariously housed or houseless? You know, what what do belongings mean? And I, I came across this really great article um, and I have the citation at the bottom here. It's called Governing the Belongings of the Precariously Housed. It's a critical legal geography. So if any of you are interested in it, um, the citation to this text is on all of these slides. So I definitely encourage folks to read this article. It's, it's, um, it's really interesting. Um, it it kind of has a, a global perspective, but I believe the authors are, or at least one of the authors is in British Columbia. So there is a lot of, of mention about specific cases in British Columbia. And so I thought I'd share a few of the important thoughts in this article with you all before we kind of get into the more practical legal issues and, and how to navigate those. So um, this article talks about how the regulation of people's belongings intersect with the regulation of their physical presence in the precarious spaces they are forced into. And as individuals carry things and depend on those things for their survival, exclusionary rules that apply to their belongings will directly impact their own ability to occupy certain spaces. And this is, you know, something I think we all encounter a lot while assisting our clients um, and we'll know will know a lot of this already and, and have seen this and have bared witness to this. The legal governance of personal belongings of the poor is widespread. And for many, the loss of destruction of possessions is endemic and it's a constant cycle. Okay, I might move a little slow through the slides as well. So um, bear with me. Okay. Okay. So for many people, as we all know, who are precariously housed and people who are houseless, belongings are located on the land and thus under control of private and public agents. So landlords, nonprofit corporations, or government. And as people move between these spaces, their possessions become subject to the will of others, such as police officers, landlords, transit authority personnel, bylaw officers, debt collectors, and the list goes 
on and on. The governance of possessions by others often places vulnerable people in situations of enhanced precarity. This includes putting people in situations where health problems are going to be exacerbated by property seizures. And example, examples of this, and it's something that I certainly have seen too much of is, you know, someone's medication is seized, you know, a bailiff comes in, they start removing all the belongings, next thing you know it, the tenant's medication had been taken. Or uh, for folks who are not housed um, and have tents or other structures, you know, having bylaw officers or police going through, ripping their tents apart, taking all of their belongings and sometimes their medication. So this obviously poses a direct risk to the health of folks as well. And policing practices that result in the seizure of drug paraphernalia and evictions directly undermine the right to health for people who use drugs, including a increased risk of overdoses, relapses, and disease. And it also takes time to accumulate belongings, as, as we all know, and it may be difficult for people to acquire replacement. It's not always easy to just have an appliance replaced or um, any other type of belonging that's essential to a person's survival. And principles of equ equality and equity are also violated. Personal belongings of housed people are far more protected than the belongings of people who are precariously housed or homeless. Discriminatory practices that fall heavily on BIPOC communities, LGBT, LGBTQ two-spirited plus communities, people with disabilities, and women who tend to be overrepresented among the precariously housed and houseless. And of course, this unfolds in intersectional ways. And I had already mentioned the, the seizure of um, personal property and the risk that that poses, but also how it underplays the significance and the value of the belongings to the owners. And that denies a person dignity as human being as well. Taking a person's belongings isn't just about, oh, this has been taken, you know, oh, well, move on. There's a lot of intrinsic problems that go alongside that. You know, it's a violation of a person's dignity. Um, belongings mean different things to different people. They have more than monetary value. Many belongings aren't replaceable or difficult to replace. And certain spaces become highly contested sites, as I mentioned, you know, nonprofit housing providers restrict, um, or sorry, as I mentioned, nonprofit housing providers, lander, landlords are part and parcel, uh, an entity that regulates space. And an example of that, again, is, as many of you all know, you know, a nonprofit housing provider will restrict the amount of possessions a tenant can bring into their buildings. I've been hearing more and more about nonprofit housing providers limiting the amount of belongings to what could fit inside of a tote. Um, and of course, what's regulated in terms of encampments, what people, um, the space they're occupying on sidewalks, et cetera. Shelter spaces can also be restrictive with limited recognition of the value of belongings. Um, you know, some shelter, shelters have uh, policies that require the property to be disposed of or again, only, only allowing a certain amount of, of belongings in or out, um, not providing a place for people to safely store items, not giving um, any privacy or protection to a person's belongings. And the, and the governance of belongings often becomes a form of governance of people through their things. And the law doesn't provide many protection for people's belongings, especially for those who are precariously housed or houseless. So I just wanted to contextualize what we're talking about here and the importance of belongings and the important work that many of us do when we're trying to help our clients retrieve their belongings or preserve their belongings. Because again, it's not just about this thing that exists that a person wants back, it represents so much more than just a thing. So um, just wanted to underscore today's presentation with some of those thoughts. And I definitely encourage those who are interested in reading that article. Um, and I'm sure that's not the only article. There's this, um, what is it? Uh, I've, I've never heard of critical legal geography, but um, it's, it seems to be a budding field. And so I think there might be more interesting type of articles that are very similar to, to the one I just referenced.
Okay, so now we're, we're going to get into to more of the law, more of the practical things we as advocates need to know. And so we're going to go back to the basics and go back to sort of the fundamentals of common law. And so to start is what what is a bailey? Starting with this concept of a bailey. And um, I have here uh, a couple of, of citations that, again, for those of you, now I, I should pause and say here that um, this presentation is I'm sure you'll already have noticed is pretty dense with information. And um, I do that on purpose because I, I hope that, you know, the presentations can then be a resource for folks as well, that the, they, they're clearly explained and, and there are references to um, either texts or laws or, or cases that folks can go back to and, and revisit and have, have a look at themselves. So uh, this idea of bailment, what it means to be in possession of someone else's property, um, the law is set out in a case here that I mentioned here. It's called Coast Crane Limited and Dominic Bridge Co. So again, it's there if you all want to have a look at this decision. But in the case, in this case, the court kind of sets out what, what bailment is. So bailment is basically when any person is to be, any person who's considered, is considered a bailee, who otherwise then as a servant either receive possession of a thing from another or consents to receive or hold possession of a thing for another upon an undertaking with the other person either to keep and return or deliver to him the specific thing or to convey and apply the specific thing according to the directions, antecedents, or future of the other person. So basically someone who's in possession of someone else's property. And uh, I'm sure this is a question you all probably already have in mind. Is a landlord a bailey? Yes, a landlord is a bailey. So there's this case I'm going to reference a few times. It's called Bellow and Wren. And in this case, the court sort of confirmed that landlords are baileys. And I want to read this paragraph of the decision for you all. And basically, the court here said, um, Mr. Bellow was away from his apartment for three to five days due to an emergency hospitalization. And the facts of this case involve a tenant who had been hospitalized. And so the landlord went ahead and just removed their belongings and then put them in the basement for storage. Didn't didn't um, didn't wait the 60 days, didn't take inventory. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but didn't take the steps they need to take that a landlord has to take under the RTA and the regulations, didn't take any of those steps, basically just grabbed their belongings, put them in the basement, then told the tenant, hey, you can come retrieve your belongings, but I'm only giving you one opportunity to do it and you have to basically get everything at once. And in this case, the tenant wasn't able to get everything at once. So some of, some of their belongings were um, not retrievable because they couldn't get it all. And then I believe the landlord disposed of those belongings they weren't able to retrieve. And I think some of the belongings were damaged as well. So those are the facts of this case. And so the court says, um, Mr. Bello was away for him from his apartment for three to five days due to an emergency hospitalization. An absence of a few days in these circumstances does not constitute an abandonment of goods within the meaning of section 24. One, and indeed no such finding was made by the dispute resolution officer. To the contrary, she noted at page two of the reasons that the landlord's evidence was that the tenant did not vacate after service of the residential tenancy branches order of possession, which is interesting because in this case, the tenant um, was overholding, but the fact that they were overholding actually worked in, in their favor here because that was proof to the court that this, this tenant wasn't intending to leave um, at that point. And then the court goes on to say that section 91 of the Residential Tenancy Act provided that except as modified or varied under the act, the common law respecting landlords and tenants applies in British Columbia. So there's that confirmation that a landlord um, does have to, or the common law applies to, I mean, it states that in the RTA, 
Um, but here court confirms that common law applies. And so the common law of bailment applies to landlords. So absent abandonment, the landlord did not have statutory authority to re remove Mr. Bellow's goods from his apartment. The landlord was therefore a bailee at common law and owed a duty of care to Mr. Bellow. Disposing of Mr. Bellow's goods by taking them to the dump, particularly when he knew that Mr. Bellow wanted those goods and was try trying to retrieve them, is a gross, gross breach of that duty. And why is this important? Why is bailment important? Why is common law important? A lot important. A lot of this is entrenched in either the act, the regulation, or the policy. But it becomes important what important when we start to get into the damages. Because there are some common law damages that you may be able to pursue that are outside of what we typically pursue based on what's in the RTA and the policy guideline about damage. Um, so that's why we're kind of going over like, what does the common law say about all this? We know what the RTA says, we know what the policy guideline says, but are there other ways we can use the common law and get creative when asking for damages and, and ask for more than just, you know, the replacement value of of a belonging. So we're going to we're going to get into that a little more, but this is why we're kind of revisiting the common law um, of bailment. Okay. Sorry, just bear with me with the slides here. Okay, this um, this is just important to note again, many of you know this, just a reminder that uh, pursuant to section 26.3 of the RTA, whether a tenant pays rent in accordance with the tenancy agreement, a landlord must not seize any personal property of the tenant or prevent or interfere with the tenant's access to the tenant's personal property. So we all know this, that, you know, a, a landlord can't just take belongings, especially when the tenant is, is paying rent. So as I mentioned, the RTA does give some protection, and this is just a, a reminder that it, it the RTA does say this, but again, we're, we're kind of going to explore the common law a bit more, see, see what else we might be able to use when we're helping our clients. And in these cases, we're going to go into when abandonment is, is triggered and, and examine abandonment a bit more. But of course, um, what we're going over now sort of applies to both situations where, you know, a, a tenant has clearly not abandoned the unit and you just have a landlord who's decided to self-remedy by either illegally evicting a tenant and taking the belongings out and destroying them, or in situations where, you know, a tenant may have been away for a while, but no indication that they've abandoned the unit. So I think all of this is applicable to, to those situations, to both situations. But again, we're going to examine abandonment in a bit. So what are the damages for a breach of a Bailey's duty of care at common law? And so basically damages, and again, this is entrenched in, in the policy as well. The goal of damages is always to restore the injured party. And there's a fun little Latin term, restituto in integrum. Um, so it's always about how do we restore the other side. And so I, I put this uh, quote here from this case called Ashton. It's a provincial court decision where, where the court kind of explains what, what the point is in trying to restore the injured party. And so court says the underlying principle in awarding damages is restituto in integrum to place the injured party in the position they were in before the damage occur as best as can be done. In determining the proper measure of damages, the award must be reasonable both to the plaintiff and the defendant. The assessment of damages is a question of fact and based on the evidence with the onus on the claimant to prove the value of their loss on the balance of probability. And so the more we kind of, okay, let's let's keep examining damages in the common law, um, we start to see that, you know, there might be some other things we can possibly ask for when we're assisting a client who is requesting damages for their belongings either being destroyed or seized, um, not necessarily just for for belongings that have been destroyed, this is also applicable for the sure fact that someone's belongings were taken from them or kept from them. 
And so there's this case, uh, Hislop Estates, um, that I noted here, um, which basically says all circumstances should be taken into account in arriving at a value for the lost goods. And going back to that case I mentioned, Bellow, um, again, the Bellow case appears a lot in this presentation. Court stated in Bellow, the dispute resolution officer had Mr. Bellow's oral evidence about his lost property, as well as a written list with estimated values, which is often all any of us have when we're assisting a client who has uh, who's pursuing a claim and damages at the RTB. Oftentimes, our clients don't have receipts or photos. I mean, most people don't keep receipts for belongings that they've purchased many years ago or take photos. So oftentimes this is all anyone's ever, this is the evidence that anyone ever has is their oral evidence and maybe a list with estimated value. So in Bellow, very much, um, I think what a lot of us encounter and what a lot of us have to work with when we are assisting tenants who are requesting damages for, um, for their belongings, either disposal or, or just, or, um, yeah. So, while the court goes on to say, while the nature of the missing property and the value of the items must be proved by the tenant, the evidence must be weighed, taking into account the difficulty a tenant faces in proving what is missing and what it is worth. A task made all the more difficult in this case because Mr. Bellow's property was unlawfully seized and disposed of by the landlord. Again, a very common occurrence many of us have probably seen. Landlord just takes the belongings and, and tosses them or keeps them in storage and away from the tenant. And so court recognized that that's problematic and the court recognized that it's difficult for a tenant to be able to quantify a monetary value or prove the monetary value of, of their belongings. And then the court goes on to say, in summary, at common law, damages are awarded to put the injured bailor in the position they were in before the goods were lost or damaged. In the absence of contract, the most the bailor can recover is replacement cost or repair cost. However, account must be taken of all the circumstances, especially when accurate information is not available. Sometimes market value must be used and sometimes intrinsic value. Betterment must be accounted for when replacing old items with new items. So again, court recognizes that this is difficult. Court recognizes that, you know, decision makers have to be mindful of how difficult it actually is to be able to demonstrate, you know, what, what the value of a belonging is. Um, and we're going to get a little, you're going to see uh, more in various examples of cases where the courts kind of thinking about value a bit differently than just monetary value. Okay, so again, common law concepts of, of, um, of basically situations where a person's possessions are basically interfered with. Um, they have they, they're, they're based on the type of interference, there's a different name given to them. So one, com, one tort where a person's belongings are being interfered with is called detinue. And some of you might know this better than I. Some of you have, may have a way better idea of torts than I do. So uh, please chime in if you have anything to add or if I'm completely mispronouncing this. I think it's detinue. I cannot remember. Um, but anyways, detinue is when a person refuses to return personal property upon the request of a person entitled to it without justification. And so I think this is a very common occurrence. Many of our clients face is, you know, they ask the landlord to return their property and the landlord's refusing to return it. And they actually have no justification to not, to not allow the tenant access to their own belongings. And so we have a case called uh, Schaffner, an insurance corporation of British Columbia, where the court stated uh, a little more on detinue. A claim in detinue lies at the suit of a person who has an immediate right to the possession of the goods against a person who is in actual possession of them and who, upon proper demand, fails or refuses to deliver them 
up without a lawful excuse. So there has to first be proper demand for access, retrieval of the belongings, and then the refusal to deliver has to be without lawful excuse. So if it's clear that the tenant has abandoned the unit, that might be a lawful excuse. But absent that, um, you know, a landlord can't just keep a person's belongings and do whatever they want with them. And so an interesting thing that I that I kind of um, came across too in, in my research of the common laws. So even again, you know, we tend to focus on when property is disposed of or when property is damaged in these types of situations. But in looking at the case law, it looks like even if property is returned, a tenant may also be able to request nominal da damages for wrongful detention of their belongings. So even though the belongings are returned and the belongings are in good condition, the fact that they were detained wrongfully might also allow for a tenant to request some additional nominal damages just for the sheer fact that the landlord wrongfully detained them, took them when they shouldn't have. Um, so yeah, something again to, to explore when we're thinking, okay, how can we get creative about damages? What are some other arguments we might be able to make? And so wrongful detention of someone's belonging might be something that, you know, we can certainly try at the RTB. So another type of tort that deals with a with the interference of a person's belonging is conversion. So convert, and all of these, it's very the lines are very blurry. Um, I found it hard to sort of distinguish the difference between conversion and, and detinue. And there are many more. <laughs> I just I just focused on detinue and conversion because I thought that these two types of torts were probably the ones that most of us come up against. Um, but the lines are very blurry. Some of them, it's hard to, well, you know, this looks like conversion or this looks like detinue. So it's hard to know uh, exactly what you're dealing with. Um, but nonetheless, I think, again, the takeaway is establishing these types of torts gives way to us being able to maybe make a bit more creative arguments and damages that rely on the common law that allow us to go outside of making those arguments that are restricted to just, you know, what the policy guideline says and, you know, what does the RTA say and just be like, okay, well, wait, we also have the common law available. Does the common law give us any more wiggle room? And I think that it does. I think that it does. So conversion involves taking, using, or destroying someone else's personal property in a way that is inconsistent with the owner's ownership. And um, for many of you learning about different torts, you might have learned about these different torts through an example of a person who owned a horse and then interference with the horse. And I kind of remembered these different horse examples, um, but uh, not not so well that I could recount them for you today. But yeah, for some of you, I'd be like, oh, I feel like this is this is the horse example stuff where it's just like if you know someone gives your horse bad food, you know what what kind of tort is it? If someone rides your horse but then returns it back to you, what type of is it? So uh, these horse examples, I'm sure if you just googled, you know these torts, this horse example would come up to help distinguish the different types. So um, that's also a good way to sort of understand the difference between these different torts. Um, okay, so back to conversion. So we have this case called Ask and Milocas. And in this case, um, Mr. Justice Collin described the legal test for conversion. So the element that must be proven to establish the tort of conversion are there has to be a wrong, wrongful act involving the wrongful act involving someone else's goods. The act must consist of handling, disposing, or destroying the goods. So here again, handling. So going back to that wrongful detention example, just handling someone else's belongings without permission could amount to this type of tort. The defendant's actions must have either the effect or intention of interfering with or denying the plaintiff or title of the goods. And I think if I go back to the horse example, conversion is the example where someone just takes the horse, rides the horse without asking for permission, returns the horse, but took it without asking and used it without asking. So I think that's the the horse example of conversion. 
And so the remedy for a conversion is that the defendant pay the value of the chattel at the time that it was wrongfully taken together with any other consequential loss. So in, in Mikolas, the court stated, while the law typically takes market price as the basis of valuation of property, it does so only because such prices are generally good evidence of its value to the owner. However, the basic rule of compensation is not market value, but value to the owner. And where the owner can demonstrate that the property had greater actual value, the actual value will be compensated. So you can start to see here, as you establish different torts, different damages come along with that type of tort. And with conversion, we start to see the court moving more toward less towards just, you know, market value of things and recognizing that it's not just about market value, that there's other value there as well. What is the actual value to the person? So what is the actual value of something that is sentimental. What is sentimental value? What is that going to be quantified as? Can we bring that up? Can we argue here's the monetary value, but this was also a sentimental belonging. So let's add to the monetary value by this much to account for the fact that this was a very special belonging to a person. So again, these common law cases and these common law torts, I think can be used in the RTB context, because again, common law applies. Um, and they may give you all the opportunity to ask for more than just the market, market value. And so a bit more from the court here that I reproduce. So value attributed to the owner beyond market value cannot be an unreasonable amount Further, an award of damages in tort generally does not take sentimental value into account, except in special circumstances, such as where there is a claim for mental distress or a deliberate act of wrongdoing. So as we know, the courts oh, is going to limit things. You know, we get a little bit, we get excited about, and then, you know, oh, wait a second, there's there, there are limits. Uh, it can't be unreasonable. So of course you can't ask for a great amount more, but again, the fact that the court acknowledges this other value, the fact that there is sentimental value and that should be considered and that should be quantified in the amount that's given, um, I think can, can certainly help us in assisting clients with these types of claims. Court goes on to say, for conversion of property that is deemed worthless, the court may award nominal damages. And again, we're going to get into, you know, we're still on common law. We're going to get into what we have, what the RTA gives us, what the regulation says, what the policy guideline says. And a lot of this common law is reflected in that. Um, however, it's not all reflected in that. So again, this these tools might help us to develop um, more creative arguments for for our clients. And so conversion of property that is deemed worthless, the court may award nominal damages. So even property that has no market value, you still may get damages for nominal damages, um, which we'll go over a bit later. The township removed and destroyed wood pallets that they regarded as an eyesore from the plaintiff's property. The Ontario Court of Appeal found that although the pallets had no market value, the plaintiff was entitled to nominal damages for the conversion. So this was like someone got damages for a bunch of wooden pallets, um, which, you know, was regarded as an eyesore, but it didn't, it didn't matter. It had other value. And so the, the tenant in this case was given nominal damages for the fact that the belongings were um, converted. And yeah, this is an Ontario case. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I imagine that if you were looking for, uh, I didn't do the deepest dive, but, um, but you know, I, I think there probably would be some BC Supreme Court or Court of Appeal cases that kind of acknowledge the same type of damages when dealing with conversion. A uh, no, key thing, to, to just highlight, and again, many of you know this, um, an arbitrator can also offset any damages to a tenant for the disposal of belongings if rent is outstanding. 
So that's always the tricky part that if rent is outstanding, if the landlord is owed money by the tenant, you know, you can go and make these claims and damages. And, you know, you might have an arbitrator that just offsets the amount of rent that is due with the amount of damages that might be due. I mean, you still might come out with being able to assist your client in getting some compensation, even though under uh, rent that's not paid is going to be offset. Um, obviously, a, a call a call to to make when advising your client about their options. But um, but again, important to keep in mind. You know, we can make awesome arguments about damages, but if you show up at, at a hearing and the landlord's there saying, "Oh, but by the way, they owe me you know X amount of dollars in rent," good chance that arbitrator is going to be offsetting that amount of rent with whatever they might grant the tenant in that situation. Okay, so um, damages under the RTA. So that was a common law. And again, a lot of the common law is entrenched in, in, the, uh, in the policy guideline in the RTA. But again, I think the common law gives us a little bit more to help us make some creative arguments. But damages under the RTA, um, pursuant to section 61, an application for damages must be made within two years of the date, the tendency to which the matter relates ends or is assigned. And that's that's an important distinction. I think um, most people kind of think of the, of, you know, the civil limitation periods where you have to start counting your timeline from when the damage is discovered, not the case here. It's when the tendency ends. So it, you know, if the damage was discovered way before the tenancy actually ended or was assigned, that's okay because your timeline doesn't start until after the tenancy actually ends. Now, of course, you know, the longer you wait, the more um, prejudicial it would be. So, you know, you want, you don't want to wait too, too long, but that two years doesn't start running until the tenancy actually ends or is assigned. And section 67 of the RTA establishes that if damage or loss results from a tenancy, an arbitrator may determine the amount of that damage or loss to pay compensation to the party who suffered the loss. And damage also include, damage and loss include damage to a person and can include both physical and mental. And again, most of you who've gone through this know the RTB doesn't typically issue um, aggravated damages or nominal damages, uh, they're, they're pretty reluctant to kind of go beyond what market value um, they're attributing to, to the belonging. And, you know, the RTB is notorious for giving really, really, really low, low uh, compensation. Um, so I'm just seeing a hand going up. Um, yeah, feel free to, to Hey, thanks. Um, I just wanted to check in about physical damages. Would that be like health because they don't have their coat or their medications? Could you just give us an example, please? So an example of... Um, Phys physical damages or loss. Right. So physical is more, would be more like if the, um, not, not damage to the persons more the damage to the object so physical damage to something if someone had a book and it was ripped or or something um physical damage to the object but then the mental is where you could bring in if someone's medication was seized um then i think that obviously leads to a host of other types of damages including the damage to the person's health, you know, establishing not having medication caused this and that this person should be compensated for that. So yeah, you can, you can certainly make the claim like my, this thing was physically damaged and given back to me in a state that is different from what it was originally, but then also this is how it impacted me. And so I'm asking for damages for the for the impact it had on me as a person as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. I think your wording was just uh, confused me a bit. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, because it says including both physical and mental. So I could see why why you know it's like oh you know you're thinking of the person in that sense, but yeah, more physical damage in terms of the object itself, that the belonging itself, and any damage to it physically. 
versus the damage to the person. Um, but again, you can you can ask for both at the RTB. Yes, start start high. My dad says start at the top and work your way that, down. That is good advice. You know, you don't <laughs> want to be so high where it's unreasonable and turn mm -hmm. off a decision maker. But you certainly don't want to be too low because if you're not asking for it, you're not going to get it. So it's a really tough balance. It's hard to figure out, okay, is this, you know, I'm going to go high, but I got to make sure it's not unreasonable because, you know, an arbitrator could easily be turned off by that. So it's hard to kind of strike that balance. But I think if you can figure out a way to justify the quantification of something, um, that might be helpful. So, you know, and uh, in, in one thing that we certainly see a lot of when quanti quantifying damages is, you know, if there's a certain amount of time that someone's been without something, you sort of attribute a percentage or a reduction and count up the days. So I think as long as you can explain to an arbitrator, this is how we quantified this. This includes the mental anguish and this is how we evaluated it. Um, I think the more likely an arbitrator is going to see that as reasonable. So it's always good to maybe have something in mind to explain how you quantified both the, the damage, the physical damage to the belonging itself, but then also any kind of, um, any kind of uh, um, damage it did to the tenant as a person, how it impacted them. So yeah, that's a very good point. Always, 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 you know, if you go too low, they're not going to give it. So ask for, ask for as much as is reasonable. Um, okay. Here we are. So um, section seven also states that the party claiming the loss or damage bears the burden of proof. So I'm sure you all know that when you're assisting a client with getting their belongings back, the burden is on the tenant to demonstrate that loss exists and then to also demonstrate um, how you arrived at the amount you are now claiming. And in order to determine whether compensation is due, the arbitrator may determine whether, and this is the following, this comes from the policy guideline and it's policy guideline 16. So basically the test that the arbitrator is going to apply is um, first, you know, a party has to fail to comply with the act regulation or tenancy agreement. Second, the loss or damage, there has been some loss or damage that resulted from the non-compliance. So there does have to be some type of loss. Sometimes there isn't really a loss. You know, if someone, um, if a landlord took someone's book for a day and then returned it back and it was in its proper condition and whatnot, um, there might not be loss or damage. However, though, if we think back to the wrongful detention, you certainly might be able to try, but you might have an arbitrator like it was a day. You know, are you is there really a loss there if the landlord took it for a day? So it's very important that the loss and damage actually exist um, in order to get compensation. The party who suffered the damage or loss can prove the amount of or value the damage of the loss, which is always, always the hard part. You know how. How, how do we begin to, to prove the amount or the value, um, especially because sometimes it's, it's really hard to know what's even been taken or what's even been damaged. So this, this, is, a really, this is a really hard, hard part um, I'm sure we all have struggled with. And then the party who suffered the damage or loss has acted reasonably to minimize the damage or loss. So of course, mitigation, always mitigation, do whatever you can to minimize the loss. Always ask, make that request. Can I have my things back? Always do whatever you can because it can, we know if, if tenants aren't mitigating the loss, then again, that decreases their chances of actually getting any compensation for it. So um, mitigation, very important. And an arbitrator may also award compensation in situations where establishing the value of the damage or loss is not as straightforward and can award nominal damages and aggravated damage. So they do have the ability to do it, but I'm sure as many of you know and have experienced, very reluctant to do so, especially aggravated damages. It is hard, but of course, ask, you know, like there's, 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 not harm in asking unless again it's completely unreasonable so you know you have to make sure it seems reasonable um but aggravated damages i i i think um 
challenging. Challenging to get. The RTB is pretty, pretty reluctant to give aggravated damages to folks. But here's an explanation of what nominal damages and aggravated damages are. So nominal damages are minimal. Um, they may be awarded where there has been no significant loss or no significant loss has been proven, but it has been proven that there has been in, an infraction of a legal right. So again, the wrongful detention of a belonging, it could warrant nominal damages, even though the actual physical book wasn't um, wasn't damaged or destroyed. And, and maybe that wasn't a book a person was reading at the time. So it didn't interrupt their reading. But the fact that it it was taken wrongfully might still result in maybe some nominal damages. And then we have aggravated damages. So aggravated damages are those damages for those intangible damages and losses. Uh, they can be awarded in situations where the wronged party cannot be fully compensated by an award for damage or loss with respect to property, money, or services. Aggravated damages may be awarded in situations where significant damage or loss has been caused either deliberately or through negligence. Aggravated damages are rarely awarded and must specifically be asked for in the application. So very important that if you are claiming those additional aggravated damages that you, you ask for that at the outset, at the application stage. Um, again, very, I mean, I feel like the only time I ever saw aggravated damages being awarded in my own experience has been illegal eviction. Something really egregious, an illegal eviction of, um, you know, someone who was very sympathetic and the disposal of health equipment, things like that, a very, very egregious situation. Um, but again, you know what? It's, it's why not ask for them if, if, if it's appropriate in, in, um, in the case, but yeah, very, very reluctant. The RTB is very reluctant to actually award these, unfortunately. Uh, when, you know, many of our clients who um, have just had their belongings taken from, taken by the landlord and a landlord's acting completely unreasonable and not giving them an opportunity to reclaim them, you know, that, that should be an automatic situation where aggravated damages are provided, but they're not, unfortunately. Okay, so now we're going to talk about abandoned property because abandoned property um, does, you know, this is a situation where the landlord may take steps to remove the belonging. So we're going to go a little bit more into what abandoned property is and looks like. And so abandoned property, and this is important, it's property which the owner has intentionally relinquished all rights. And definitions are critical regarding laws and cases that concern the belongings of people who are houseless and people who are precariously housed. And this includes whether the belongings are deemed to have been abandoned, lost, or misplaced. This is interesting. So in Canada, Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as we know, protects life, liberty, and security of the person. It expressly omits property as a protected ground. In contrast, in the U.S., the 14th Amendment forbids the state from depriving a person of any life, liberty, or property without due process. I mean, I don't know how that is exercised in the United States. I'm going to guess probably not in a way that is uh, is very, um, yeah, my guess is it's probably not in a fair way or a just way, but it's interesting that that's at least acknowledged by, um, by the Americans um, in their constitution, but not in ours. So that's, I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, Yeah, so although, the, and I found this in, in that article I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, so although the constitutional protection of belongings has not been recognized in Canada, there are two cases that may help advance a future argument that personal possessions are critical to the life, liberty, and security of the person. And they're both cases, I believe, that um, involved tent encampments. So, um, you know, that article, the authors are very hopeful that, you know, these cases could open the door to recognizing property as a protection of property as 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 a right but we'll we'll see <laughs> not uh you know a little skeptical but 
Uh, and I haven't read those cases. So um, uh, I do plan to, to kind of understand where the authors of that article see it. And maybe some of you are more familiar with that and, and could speak to that. But just thought I'd, I'd highlight that for those who are interested. Okay, so abandonment of property. So section 44 of the act states a tenancy ends if the home is abandoned. The regulation gives us a bit more of, okay, what is abandonment? So section 24, one of the regulation states that a landlord may consider a tenant has abandoned personal property if the tenant leaves the personal property on residential property that the tenant has vacated after the tenancy agreement has ended. So, you know, that could include situations where landlord has an OP, OP is effective, and there are still belongings on the property. At that point, they could. Whether or not is abandonment is a different, is a whole different thing, but at that point, they could consider, okay, this is, this is abandoned property. Subject to subsection two, a tenant leaves the personal property on residential property that for a continuous period of one month, the tenant has not ordinarily occupied and for which the tenant has not paid rent. So if, you know, if there's clearly no intention here for the landlord or for the tenant to go back, they haven't been there in a month, they haven't paid rent, their property is just sitting in the unit, that could be a, a situation where the landlord considers the, the unit abandoned. And from which the tenant has, or from which the tenant has removed substantially all of their, their personal property. So again, if it looks like they've moved and what's left behind has intentionally been left behind. Intention is important when considering abandonment. And the landlord is entitled to consider the circumstances described in the previous paragraphs as abandonment only if the landlord receives an express or oral or written notice of the tenant's intention not to return to the property, or the circumstances surrounding the giving up of the rental unit are such that the tenant could not reasonably be expected to return to the residential property. So again, either the there is a clear expression, I'm not coming back. So this stuff in here, you know, do what you want with it, or the circumstances um, are such that y y it doesn't it's not reasonable to expect the tenant's going to come back. So that could be situations where landlord got an OP, OP, effective date of the OP has long passed, and there are still things in the unit that uh, the tenant has not come back to retrieve or expressed any interest in wanting to come back to retrieve. So I looked at some, um, I did a little review of a bunch of RTB cases to kind of get a sense of the types of cases where the RTB has found the home was abandoned. So a landlord may treat the home as abandoned if the tenant passes away and no action has, ta has taken place by the estate of the deceased and rent has not been paid in a month. It appears the belongings were intentionally left behind. So there's one case I read where uh, there were a bunch of belongings that were sort of grouped together in boxes. Um, also, where are the location of the items? If, are the belongings left unprotect, unprotected? Does it basically look like that the tenant doesn't care about these items? They're not trying to protect them. They're just kind of sitting there. Maybe they're grouped together because the tenant cleaned the unit and didn't know where to put them. So they just put all of that stuff in one corner. So again, what does it look like? Does it look like the tenant is not coming back for this? The tenant does not demonstrate an intention to retrieve the belong their belongings. So this was in cases like, you know, the tenant gives vague timelines for retrieval, failing to communicate, not showing up on an agreed upon date. So if the tenant at some point communicated an intention to collect their belongings, but then don't really follow through, you know, if they say, okay, I'll come meet you this day to get them, and then they don't show up, and then there's nothing beyond that. So they can express an intention, but if there's no follow through in the intention to come back, then a landlord can consider the property abandoned and dispose of it. Or the tenant is awaiting placement in a care facility. Um, found a couple of cases like that where the tent where the landlord knew the tenant was just awaiting to be placed in a care facility, knew the situations, and it was reasonable to expect that whatever they left behind was not going with them. Okay, um, so another case here that um, I wanted to cite where the court kind of 
recognize that a landlord has to act reasonably. If, if a tenant does express interest in wanting to retrieve their items, the landlord has to act reasonably in that case. And so there's this case called Billion and Val in court. Uh, it's, an, again, another Ontario case. Um, the court quoting another case um, said down in that co- case, it quoted that landlords that fail to act reasonably in the circumstances face risk of liability. Court went on to say uh, that in that case, the court held that circumstances of the case before her, that reasonable positive steps should be taken to make arrangement arrangements for the tenants to move their belongings, a landlord must act reasonably. A landlord cannot simply ignore attempts on behalf of tenants to contact them or turn a blind eye to what they know is not simply abandonment of property. The landlord's conduct in this case was egregious and easily meets any test for abusive process. So if a landlord is just, you know, ignoring a tenant, um, you know, again, turning a blind eye or it's clear that the tenant has expressed an intention to want to treat the belongings and the landlord's not doing anything to help facilitate that or blocking them from being able to do that, then, you know, that, that, that's a problem. Landlords do have to uh, allow tenants the opportunity to retrieve their belongings when it's clear that they did not intend to leave them behind. So again, the intention piece is really important to determine whether or not the property is actually abandoned. So the landlord has a duty, well-established landlord has a duty of care when dealing with personal belongings. So um, 24.3 of the regulation does state that if personal property is abandoned, the landlord may remove the personal property from the residential property and on removal must deal with it in accordance with the following. So the landlord has to store the tenant's personal property in a safe place and manner for a period of not less than 60 days following the date of removal. I can tell you all this, I know landlords are lobbying to have that 60 days decreased. They think it's too long. Uh, Whether or not that is going to change, I know that is something that that they are lobbying for. And again, they they seem to think 60 days keeping someone's belongings is too much of a burden on them. So we'll see if, um, if the government hears them on that and reduces that 60 days to something less. They're supposed to keep a written inventory of the property. They're supposed to keep particulars of the disposition of the property for two years following the date of disposition and advise a tenant or tenant's representative who requests the information, either that the property is stored or that it has been disposed of. So landlord has to do a lot. The landlord cannot just toss a person's belonging. And I certainly haven't come across a landlord that's done any of this. I don't know if any of you have, maybe, maybe there are uh, landlords who do this. I'm sure there are, but in my experience, this isn't happening. They're not storing the items for 60 days, let alone keeping an inventory of the property. And we'll see why that might happen. There are situations where they don't need to, but even in, but you know, still like, I, I, I don't think landlords are taking the time to, observe the duty of care that they do have towards the tenant's belongings. And so here are situations where a landlord may dispose of the property. It's got to be in a commercially reasonable manner. Um, I don't know what that means off the top of my head. There might be some case law that helps to define what a commercially reasonable manner is, but That does need to happen. I don't think they can just toss certain items in a dumpster that don't belong in a dumpster. But uh, again, that's that is not defined in the uh, in the RTA regulation. I don't think it's defined in the policy either, but there might be some case law where that is. And feel free to chime in if any of you are are aware of a definition of commercially reasonable manner. Um, But they can. Danielle, sorry, there's a comment in the chat that actually some people, it's not about commercially responsible, but just about um, items being disposed of from a manufactured home parks, um, sometimes even the trailers. So, Hey, that's my question. I was also wondering um, total market value, um, because we've talked about uh, actual value and intrinsic value. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 sorry, Jen, that's just a, uh, you're just response. So that comment, 
Uh, in the interior, we see a number of landlords dispose of manufactured home tents pro pro property, including their trailers. Um, and yeah, and so you, you were saying that that's, you know, you're talking about the value, like the intrinsic value versus, yeah, I mean that like people's entire homes that they've purchased are being disposed of in the manufactured home park context. I, you know, I think there's one case, ooh, if I can, I can't remember the name of it um, because that's a whole other, you know, I, I, I don't deal with that in this presentation. I, I probably should have devoted some some time to that because that's, that's a real serious problem. Um, you know, if a person's evicted, the landlord can actually dispose of the manufactured home, which the tenant owns, because for those of you who maybe aren't so familiar with manufactured home park situations, I myself don't have a ton of experience with it, but um, the pad is what's being rented, but the home is often owned and, and Jen or anyone else, feel free to, to fill, fill in or add to this. It's the home that's actually, the manufactured home is actually owned by the tenant, but once they're evicted, um, most of the, those manufactured homes cannot simply be driven off the property. For many folks, they've made them permanent structures, removed the re wheels. Um, some people have, you know, erected structures to make it permanent, and then they become evicted, and the landlord is now in a position to where they can dispose of the manufactured home that a person owns or sell it to. And I think there is a case that... Um, I might completely be getting this wrong, but I think there was a case I read a while back ago that dealt with the sale of a person's manufactured home. And so I think the argument was that the, the tenant should have received the proceeds of the sale. And there was an argument about value because, you know, it's like, did the landlord sell the manufactured home? at the appropriate value or did they actually sell it for less? And then what do you do with the proceeds? And I think that case said something to the effect of had the tenants had an appraisal of the manufactured home and the landlord sold it for, there's something about appraisals. I'm so sorry, it's not, I thought I remembered it better than I am. I'm not though, if anyone else knows. We usually refer it to a civil suit because I'm lucky to have like a lawyer and an articling student where I work. Um, yeah. Rosie, no, sorry, my dog's here. Um, I, yeah, I don't know the certain case, but I was also curious about like property value less than 500 because I'm sure you'll see um, for well, low income clients, um, as I do even for clients in trailers where they don't own the trailer, they may think their property or the market value is more than 500, but the landlord's just like, oh, it was garbage. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my mic. Exactly, exactly. And I think you see that a lot with things like art. You know, I had a client who had all this amazing art that his son had made, um, and they just tossed it because they're like, that's, that's not, that's not valued over $500. And it's like, it's art, though, or like, who are you to value a piece of art? And also that art had sentimental value, because it was, you know, from his son, and they, and you cannot get that back. That art is gone. Art is, you know, there's no reproduction. There's no whatever. That that was gone. What do you do with that? Or um, objects that have cultural significance that a landlord will not fully appreciate. You know, who gets to make that determination of something that's valued under less than five hundred dollars? Because you, you, it's not so easy unless someone's getting someone in to appraise their belongings on a regular basis you know, you're not really going to have that proof before the item's disposed of, of its value. And again, I think that's especially the case for things like art or, or things that have cultural significance. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's the reality is, I think for a lot of our clients um, who are low income, a lot of their belongings do get thrown out because the landlord sits there and says, oh, well, it was all less than $500, but why do they make that call? Um, so we'll, we'll get into that a, a little bit more, this, you know, market value and, and less than $500, um, because that is absolutely a problem. Who who gets to say what the value of something is when it's not clear cut? Uh, and yeah. Yep. Um, you know that case you're trying to remember? Yes. When you remember it, would you be able to send yeah. it to me and then I'll send it to the group people are interested Abs in it. Absolutely. Yeah. I I'm so sorry. I wish I could remember it. And again, like I, uh, we don't do too many manufactured 
home park cases. So my knowledge, my top of the head knowledge is not so great. And it was a while ago that I read this, but I remember in my mind at the time, I thought, oh, you know, should we certainly um, advise clients if they can to try to get it appraised? Because if they do, there might be some kind of damages or compensation they can request later on if the landlord undervalued it or something. But I just made a note to myself, I will definitely um, find it and send it to you, Lois, and then you can circulate it to everyone. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so right, so property that's a total market of less than five hundred dollars can landlord can reason if they reasonably believe if that can dispose of it in a commercially reasonable manner, the cost of removing, storing, and selling the property would be more than the proceeds of its sale. So again, landlord gets to make a value call here, and that the storage of the property would be unsanitary or unsafe. And again, like a landlord can just say, well, blah blah blah, this thing was unsanitary or unsafe. So. In this case, landlord gets to make a lot of value judgments that results in, you know, the disposal of someone's property and 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 in many cases wrongfully. Because I think again, a lot of us probably come across this a lot where the landlord's like, oh, it was unsafe, it was unsanitary, it was under five hundred dollars or whatever their excuses are, and it's like, you know, no, that's that's not at all true. Um, now, a court may, on application, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, determine the value of the property for the purpose of subsection two. So, I mean, again, I don't know how many, like a lot of times this happens so fast. Um, I, you know, I don't know how many people would actually be in the position to go make an application to the court to have the court determine the value of the property. I think that would be very challenging. And again, these things usually happen so quickly. Um, you would really have to have the foresight that something might happen before it's taken away and disposed of, but you could, you could do that. I mean, that that's there, whether or not practically it's something anyone is able to do, given all the barriers to accessing the courts. And again, how urgent and um, quick these things go, but it's there, it's something that tenants can do. Um, and then of course, section 30 of the regulation totally, uh, you know, totally explicitly says, landlords, you have to exercise reasonable care and caution required by the nature of the property and the circumstances to ensure that the property does not deteriorate and is not damaged, lost or stolen as a result of an inappropriate method of removal, removal or an unsuitable place of storage. So that duty of care, it's there, it's clear, you know, they have to take certain steps, including making sure the belongings are safely secured and not going to be damaged and not going to be stolen, which again, many landlords do not do, but it's very explicit. Now, um, section 26, one of the regulation outlines when a tenant can claim for abandoned property. So if a tenant claims their property at any time before it's disposed of, the landlord can, before returning the property, require the tenant to reimburse the landlord for the landlord's reasonable costs of removing and storing the property. Uh, you know, some landlords will store the property in a storage facility. Many of them will just store it in a basement or a storage locker that's not costing them anything. But of course, if they are storing the items in a storage facility, they can ask for that money before, um, before the tenant can access and retrieve their property. Also, the cost of the search required to comply with Section 27, which is a notice of disposition and satisfy any amounts payable by the tenant to the landlord on this act or tenancy agreement. So in this case, this is a situation where, you know, if a tenant owes rent, the landlord can say, hey, pay me my rent before I give you your property. Um, so if a tenant makes a claim um, under the section, but does not pay the landlord the amount owed, the landlord may dispose of the property. So if, you know, this essentially does allow a landlord to keep a tenant's belongings when they do owe them money, even though they're not supposed to take someone's belongings during the tenancy when rent is owed. If the property is abandoned, they can 
uh, certainly say, hey, you owe me this, you owe me this rent. So until you give me that, I'm going to hold on to this stuff and I can't dispose of the property. So here's another thing that's come up um, that I've noticed have come up a few times for me, and that's pets. Um, so we're going to talk now a, a little bit more about bailiffs and when the bailiffs are showing up and what the bailiffs can and cannot do and, and what goes on in, in those situations. And, and it, it made me think of situations where pets are seized too, because that, that happens, um, that bailiff shows up and there's a pet. So if there are pets in the home and nowhere for the pets to be placed, the bailiffs will call animal control and pets will be taken to a shelter. Some of you may have, may have experienced something different. This is based on, I, I did call bailiff companies to ask what they did, but I called Vancouver companies. Um, it might, some of you may have different experiences, but the response I got was if there isn't a safe place for the pet to go, they will call animal control and the pet will be taken to a shelter. Now, again, that's what I was told by the bailiff. What the companies are supposed to do and their policies say to do are often different from what the bailiffs actually do. So this is what they're supposed to do. They may not always do this. Um, I did, I did, you know, kind of look, look to see what what types of services are out there. And so there are some shelters like the Vancouver Humane Society that is partnering. They say there's partnering with social service agencies to break down the barriers and support the pets of women who are seeking housing or maintaining their housing while caring for a pet in crisis. So there might be a program in your community that does sort of help folks in crisis, this one in particular is, is women in crisis and help to house their pets um, during that time of crisis. So I mentioned that here because there might be, again, other, other partnerships or other programs in your communities that do help with that. Um, the city of Vancouver, so if, so if you have a client, their pet has been taken to a shelter, I looked up how you can claim your animal from the shelter. Uh, again, this is city of Vancouver, so it might be different in your communities, um, or they might be very similar. These might be similar types of fees and processes, but um, I look to Vancouver because that's where I am to um, to see what what's required. So the, the city of Vancouver states that if you want to claim your unlicensed dog from the Vancouver Animal Shelter, you have to, and this ton of barriers, ton of barriers here, provide proof of ownership, which not every pet owner has, but it can include adoption or purchase paperwork and a vet record with both the dog's owner information, license information from another municipality. Now, People don't always get pets in these ways. Sometimes pets are given to people by other people. There's no official transfer of the pet. Um, so immediately this is a barrier because not everyone has this proof of ownership of the pet. They have to have government issued picture identification, another barrier. Not everyone has government issued ID. So you can see here that a lot of people who have pets that are seized aren't actually able to retrieve them because of these barriers. Now, I don't know if any of these shelters are flexible with this or understand that these are barriers and would relax this or not. I guess that, you know, would depend on, that would depend on, you know, I guess who you might be dealing with at any particular time. But um, this is the information that, that I got from their website about how to do it. So already immediate barriers. Um, and then you have to pay a fee. So there's an unlicensed impound fee. Um, you have to purchase a dog license. If you do not live in Vancouver, you have to show proof of a license from another municipality and you have to bring a leash or collar. And the daily, so they charge a boarding fee. So daily boarding fees will apply 24 hours after contact with the owner. The fee to retrieve your dog depends on if it's licensed and also depends on if it's aggressive. And again, I don't know how they necessarily make that determination, if it's like a history of aggression, if in the shelter it's been aggressive, but apparently it's a different fee if you have an aggressive dog. So the pickup fee is $188 plus $45 for an unlicensed dog and $96 for a licensed dog. And then 400, and it goes up pretty significantly, $443 and $45 for an aggressive unlicensed dog. And then the board. So, sorry, there's a link in the chat that Marina's put in about a group that provides some support 
but I'm not sure how much you might want to speak to this too, Marina. Sorry, it's hard yeah. to interrupt. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I, uh, uh, because I work as an advocate at the courthouse, uh, oftentimes my clients have to go into treatments uh, kind of uh, on an urgent basis. So I spoke with these guys and uh, with the coordinator, I forget her name. Uh, I think the, the overall organization is Pause, uh, Pause for Hope. And they're brand new or about a year old. And they said they have this program, No Pet Left Behind, initially started off as a way of helping women who are fleeing violence. Uh, and now they've uh, extended their services to those uh, folks that are going into treatments. They have uh, volunteer foster homes for, for pets. Uh, they also have volunteer drivers that will go and pick up their the pets. And uh, she also told me that most uh, shelters will offer to hold their pet as an emergency onboarding uh, for two weeks. So I wonder if somebody were to contact uh, these uh, folks that would be able to help out, especially if it's uh, coming from an advocate. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that information. Um, so obviously it looks like there are a lot of, of um, community organizations that do try to assist folks who are in crisis or try to uh, assist folks who are having barriers to um, accessing their pets. Also, someone in the chat noted some breeds are deemed aggressive. That's true. You're, you're totally right. Some breeds are just um, deemed aggressive. Um, so that's that's true, which is, you know, pretty unfortunate because, again, the increase in price jumps <laughs> from 188 to 443. $443. Um, and if that's just based on the type of breed, uh, that is extremely prob problematic. And so those are just the pickup fees. Then you have the boarding fees on top of that. And that depends on the animal. I just put dogs in here again, but the website does outline the different boarding fees depending on the animal that a person may have. But it's $25 a day for a non-aggressive dog and $33 a day for an aggressive dog. So again, you can see these barriers that a person may have to being able to actually retrieve their animal if it is seized. And so um, I don't know if any of these, you know, some of these organizations sounds like they they help out in a preventative way. I, you know, um, interested to know what, what, um, what assistance or support there is for folks who've already had the animal seized and now aren't able to afford to get the animal back, you know, if there are any supports to help with those fees. Be curious to know a bit more about that. But nonetheless, I, I, I wanted to um, note this because again, pets are, are essential. Pets are an important part of a person's life. So when a pet is taken, a family member, a friend is taken, um, it's, it's extremely impactful and extremely concerning that a person may not be able to actually get their pet back. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to note that too, because it does come up, you know, where there's a pet in the unit and a uh, tenant may not have a place for the pet to go at that time. Or, you know, what happens if the tenant is not in the unit when the bailiffs show up because they don't need to be in there and there's a pet there. Do they wait for the tenant to come back to find out what to do with the pet? Or do they just go straight to a shelter. My guess is the latter. My guess is bailiffs aren't waiting around if they see a pet in there. Um, I've heard of one situation where a pet was left in the unit. Um, got a call from a tenant and they said bailiffs came and my cat is still in the unit and my landlord will not let me access the unit to get my cat. So that was, uh, that was uh, absolutely, as you can imagine, a horrible situation. So again, each bailiff kind of, you know, bailiffs don't seem to be consistent. Um, so feel free to share your experiences with bailiffs and, and how animals were treated um, when they've shown up. But yeah, so it's a little, little bit on pets. Um, now we're going to go back to you know, the beginning with bailiffs and um, just a little reminder of, of bailiffs and the process. So many of you know, when a tenant's evicted, a landlord can never, never remove a tenant's belongings. They can't change the locks. That would be unlawful. Only a bailiff 
can't remove a tenant, tenant's belongings, a tenant if need be. Um, so landlords, you know, you can't ever do that. And the bailiff does have to be court appointed. So again, as many of you know, uh, always important to have tenants check to ensure and confirm that the bailiff is a court appointed bailiff. We know that there are some fake bailiff companies. Um, I'm sure those of you who serve the Vancouver area, maybe in other communities as well, there are fake bailiff companies that pose as bailiffs and people believe they are bailiffs and allow them in and, and, and do whatever. So always important to check and ensure that it's a court appointed bailiff um, and to forcibly evict a tenant, you know, a landlord. So just, this is just a, again, just a little bit of a summary of, of what needs to happen. Uh, you know, we all know landlord gets that order of possession. They're almost always effective within two days. Once those two days expire, the landlord can go get a writ of possession, which they get very easily. Um, it's really unfortunate because the writ of possession, the way you get it, if those of you aren't familiar, you basically just, it's an affidavit. You're swearing to certain things in an affidavit, including I've confirmed there are no pending appeals. The deadline, um, the deadline for appeal has passed. And that gets complicated because you know, you have to consider things like deem service and landlords don't necessarily do that. So they might be swearing to something they think is true. That's actually not true. You know, a person may not have actually been served yet because the deem service provisions haven't kicked in. You know, maybe the tenant's not home and they don't even know. So um, they're problematic because the landlord doesn't necessarily know the laws around that and can confirm whether or not the date the, the deadline to uh, apply for reconsideration is passed. They don't know that. And the court doesn't cross-reference, uh, uh, you know, the affidavit with whether or not there's a reconsideration pending either. So even though a tenant may have applied for reconsideration, which theoretically puts the eviction on pause, a landlord who is comfortable with perjury can still get that writ because there's no checking to see whether or not there is a pending appeal or not. They take, you know, it's an affidavit. So the court's taking their word for it. Um, so it's not on, you know, we've seen that happen where there's a pending reconsideration and then all of a sudden clients calling, there's a bailiff at my door. Um, what, um, someone's asking what the recourse is if the bailiff, is, uh, if the landlord is swearing something that isn't true. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, there's always like contempt and perjury um, actions, which realistically, you know, it's very difficult for a tenant to to pursue that, to actually uh, go to court and, and um, make an application for those things. However, if a landlord does illegally obtain a writ, what it what a tenant can do in that case is actually apply for a stay on the writ. So even if they illegally obtained the writ, bailiffs have already come and cleared the unit out. Even in that case, a tenant can apply for a stay on the writ and ask a judge to grant them immediate access to the unit. And you could even ask for an order that the that the that the landlord place their belongings back in the unit. So if they've, if they've um, removed belongings, if they, if their belongings have gone to storage, you can ask for that order as well. Actually, I don't know. Um, it, yeah. So there's actually a, 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 a case. Um, I don't know if, if Odette from Kamloops is on here or not, if she is, she can talk to it because it was her case, but uh, Odette had a, had a, a case there and she sent me the decision. I can circulate that decision as well where that happened. I mean, literally, I, I think it was it was Odette or someone from Odette's office was was literally at the court getting the stay while the bailiffs were removing the tenant's belongings. And the tenant said, my lawyer is getting the stay right now. Like pause, she, she's getting it, she'll be on her way. Um, and she she got it, sped down there with the stay and uh, landlord said it's too late. So the landlord knew they were in the process of getting the stay, told the bailiffs continue to do your job and bailiffs often will, right? Bailiffs, I've tried talking down bailiffs. I'm sure you all have too. It doesn't work. They have a job to do and they will go in and do that job. And, uh, you know, I, I rarely do I think they may pause. It's possible, but um, I certainly have not had any luck with trying to talk down a bailiff, but, you know, 
they knew in the process of getting the stay, show up with the stay, and then the and then the uh, landlord's just like, sorry, you're you're too late. So uh, in that case, the tenant was successful. The judge did make an an order for the landlord to allow immediate access to the tenants to the unit, so they were able to go back in. Um, and the judge in that case did say, you know, it was improper for the bailiffs to continue to remove the belongings when they knew that the tenant's lawyer was in the process of obtaining the stay. So in that decision, we actually have the court acknowledging that's not proper. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't, you should have waited knowing that stay was coming. So it was a really good outcome for, for the tenant. And so it is something that folks can do. So it's not it's not necessarily the end of the road when the bailiff shows up. It certainly becomes more difficult and it's certainly a race against time, but the tenant can always apply for a stay on the OP and the writ and that order that they be given immediate access back. And I think if you can prove the landlord lied to get that writ of possession, um, you know, you're more likely to get, you can ask for that state in any situation. It doesn't have to be a situation necessarily where the landlord lied to, to obtain the writ, although it does become really, really difficult. Otherwise you still have to, you still have to demonstrate other parts of a legal test, but nonetheless, um, that is something you can do. You just explain to the court, Hey, they, they shouldn't have done this in the first place. And, um, that's one thing you can do. But if you wanted to take it a step further because they they lied under oath, you know, there's contempt, there's perjury. But, you know, I I, I don't know that anyone really has the capacity to to pursue that. And I, I've, I've never done a case like that myself, so I, I have no idea how they go or um, how you go about doing that off the top of my head. But that is that is something that, you know, certainly would be available. But practically, a lot of folks may pursue that. So. And we'll we'll get that case from Odette and again post that on Shed. Uh, yeah, I'll send that as well. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, I'll send both those cases to you all. And then uh, important thing to note too, and again, I'm, I'm sure most of you know this, but just a refresher that landlords do not need to serve the writ of possession in advance. So for anyone who's new and maybe hasn't been in a situation yet where they've um, had a tenant, you know, uh, be in a situation where the bailiff is showing up, the writ does not need to be served in advance. Oftentimes the bailiffs are showing up, either they have the writ or the landlord's with them and the writ. So you don't get any advance notice. So you can pretty much once that order, that order of possession is granted, you just sort of have to act as if once it's effective in those two days, assuming it's gonna be effective in two days, the landlord's gonna to run to the court the very next day um, and, and try to get a writ. And of course, if a reconsideration is pending, you hope that, you know, by telling the landlord a reconsideration is pending, they'll hold off on getting a writ. But again, that's theoretical. We've seen it happen where landlords have still gone off even though a review is pending, um, either because they didn't care about lying under oath or they actually didn't really know what they were swearing to. And again, because you're not having anyone, um, anyone, gatekeeping or checking there's no checks and balances there aren't any safeguards to prevent anything from happening if a landlord is lying right because the court it's just an affidavit there's no hearing there's no crossings there's nothing it's an affidavit you swear it usually that's it the court will issue the writ so okay rule of the court appointed bailiff so i'm just looking at the time it's 2 34 we have until three so i'll try to speed through the rest of this as as quickly as possible because i'd like to hopefully get through all of it before we're done for the day and leave time for questions um role of the bailiff so again court bailiff only people allowed to enforce an eviction uh court bailiff companies contracted under the Ministry of the Attorney General. A list of court bailiff companies by region can be found on the BC government website as well. Um, role of the police. So the police don't have authority to evict tenants. Many of you have probably experienced this where uh, police are very hands off. If, if it's a tenancy issue, they will say this, this isn't us, you know, solve it at the RTB. Um, so they, they're hands off, but a court bailiff may ask a cop to attend to keep the peace while a tenant is being removed. You know, if there is maybe a history there or a concern that things may escalate, 
a peace officer may attend, but they don't have any authority to actually evict a, a, a tenant. Um, there may be some discrete instances where a cop overstepped and involved themselves um, without there being any kind of criminal element going on. Um, but um, for the most part, th th they don't have authority to evict or do anything in that situation. Again, be aware of unlicensed bailiffs. And I did put Vancouver Eviction Services because that's the one I'm aware of and have had to deal with. Um, Interestingly, a tenant, so a tenant can request compensation for damage of loss when a landlord hires an unlicensed bailiff, or they also, it may be a violation of trespass. If you have an unlicensed bailiff carrying out the duties of a bailiff, it could be a violation of the trespass law, and it could be something that a tenant requests compensation for. So there may be things a tenant can do when in this situation, a landlord has hired an unlicensed bailiff and they carried out the duties of a regular bailiff. Sorry, court appointed bailiff, not a regular bailiff. So can a court bailiff sell a tenant's belongings? A court bailiff can sell a tenant's belongings, but there are exceptions. So the landlord, and I'm going to get to those in a bit, um, the landlord is responsible for paying the court bailiff, which could cost between $1,200 and $1,500 as well. And again, I just want to say this could vary depending on, on, on your community. This, again, is information um, that I've, I've obtained from Vancouver bailiff companies. Um, and pursuant to sections, so so the exemption, so they so landlords can sell belongings, but there are these exemptions. You can find them in the Court Order Enforcement Act, and so some belongings are exempt from being seized and sold by court bailiffs. So these exemptions include necessary clothing for a person in their dependents, medical and dental aids for a person in their dependents, four thousand dollars worth of household furnishings and appliances, a vehicle worth worth up to five thousand dollars tools or other items that a person requires for work worth up to $10,000, and works of art or other objects of cultural or historical significance brought into British Columbia for temporary public, public exhibit. That one is kind of buried deep in the Court Enforcement Act, but I found it. And so I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include this because this was one I wasn't aware of until I actually looked at the Court Enforcement Act a bit more, uh, a bit more closely. And so if there's a dispute about the value of the items selected for exemption, section 74 to 78 of the Court Order Enforcement Act provides a method for appraisal. If, you know, a tenant is claiming an exemption and the bailiff is not agreeing with the cost of that item. Um, one thing I do want to know about this, because this is something I recently came across that was new to me. And again, I think there seems to be some inconsistency with bailiff practices. And, and I noticed that just within Vancouver. So there may be some inconsistencies between bailiff practices in Vancouver and other communities communities outside of Vancouver. But um, so recently I had a client who was evicted and the bailiff shows up and I tell the client about the exemptions and the client tries to claim the exemptions and then tells me that the, the bailiff didn't let them claim the exemptions, which I thought was very strange. So I contacted the bailiff to ask why. And so what I was told was, so many of you probably remember this, uh, and maybe this still goes on, but this is what I was told. And I, and I do remember this scene, this happening in the past where, you know, if a bailiff shows up and the bailiff feels there's, they can't get any, there's no value to someone's belongings, they can't resell it to recover their costs, they leave it out on the property line. So that is what I remember being, being the common practice for as long as I've been doing this. Um, but then what the bailiff told me was the reason why my client couldn't claim these exemptions was because they were not being seized for sale. They were actually being seized, or actually they didn't use the word seized. They were being very careful about that. They were being taken for safe storage. So what I was told after the bailiffs had, um, some of you might have been consulted, but the bailiffs did consult with um, with different organizations about their services. And after this consultation process, they were told that oftentimes bailiffs will put belongings on the property line, they would become damaged, they would, they would get stolen. So what I was told is now bailiffs were taking, rather than leaving belongings on the property items, they were taking items into safe storage so that the items could be protected. So that's why my client couldn't claim any exemptions. 
So I was like, okay, so can they come? So then I told my client this, I said, your, your items are actually not being kept for sale. They're kept for safe storage. So my client follows up with the bailiff and, and the, the storage company that the bailiff used and the storage company told my client that um, basically, yeah, these are for safe storage, but there's a fee you have to pay to retrieve your belongings, which was not adding up. So contact the bailiff company again. Um, actually, no, I spoke to Peter Hamilton and you'll see I have his contact information. Some of you maybe have already dealt with him. Um, I forget his actual title, but he's like, you know, the, the head of the bailiffs, like he's, a, I think, the director of the program. Um, that Bayless fall under. And so I contacted him and I told him what happened. And he said, the storage company prefers for people to pay the fee for people to retrieve their belongings, but they don't have to pay it. Which obviously problematic because my client was not told that. My client was told you have to pay the fee. So they used these bullying tactics to try to get my client to pay a fee he didn't have to pay. So when he went and he told them like, no, I know I don't have to pay this. They said, fine. And uh, he was able to retrieve his belongings, but the catch is, and again, I'm sure you probably encountered this, the storage companies that the bailiffs use don't want people coming in, uh, in and out, taking their belongings. People have to come one trip, take everything out in one trip. There's no coming multiple times to get everything or to slowly get things. You have to come once and, and take everything at that one time. So this was something new. This was not something I knew about until I encountered this situation with a client of mine. Um, so again, bailiff inconsistent practices. We might think we know how they operate, but then you're thrown, <laughs> you're thrown um, off because it's like, okay, well, the bailiffs are doing this now. So yeah, so that all that's to say is you might encounter this where you know a client is saying, oh, here are my exemptions. But then they say no. We're we're taking we're taking this into uh, into safe storage. There were some other problems though because what I was being told by the bailiff was not at all my client's experience. So um, I don't think the bailiff was being honest with me when when I asked the questions I asked. Um, my client actually did have medications seized, so I don't know why they think taking his medications into storage was for his benefit to safely store his items. I mean, I, that didn't make any sense to me, but um, nonetheless, you know, he, they didn't sell his belongings. It was only going to be stored also for a period of 30 days. So um, that was important to know. And again, I, I would just recommend folks follow up because I feel there is inconsistent practices amongst bailiffs, bailiffs in Vancouver. So I can imagine that inconsistency is probably province wide. You'll see a comment in the comments saying that some people are being asked to pay storage fees. Yeah, and they may not. They may not have to. So what I would say is, because that, that's that was my client's experience. He was told they have to pay a storage fee. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense. If they're taking the items for safe storage, which they would otherwise just put out on the property line and are saying, we're doing this for your benefit, that doesn't make sense now that you're going to charge them a fee if they can't access their belongings, if they're not able to pay that fee, then you're not doing them a favor the way you think you're doing them a favor, you know, like some people might prefer to have it on the property line then, you know, so, um, so I would say, it, yeah, like maybe follow up with the company that is storing because again, they told my client that but then when I followed up I was told that's the preference they ask people to pay it if they can, but they can't legally charge the, the people the fee to remove and these are landlord's fees the landlord is the one who has to pay the fee to keep the items in storage that's why the bailiffs are able to sell the items to recover their fees and why a landlord can go back to the rtb and ask for a tenant to pay their fees so these fees should not fall onto tenants yeah, so by the time the client gets there, the bailiffs are gone and the storage companies are telling clients, I would follow up with Peter Hamilton. That's who I followed up with and I got that answer. I got that, no, they can't charge them the, the, the fee. And I uh, I sent that email to my client and, and my client brought that email. So I don't know if, if that's um, what did it or not, but I have Peter Hamilton's contact information later in the presentation because that's what I what I had to do. Like I, I, I had to go above 
the head of the uh, head lead bailiff who was in charge of um, going into my client's place and, and arranging and facilitating that eviction. Um, and I wasn't satisfied with his responses. So when I went to Peter Hamilton, that's when I was told they actually don't, he didn't have to pay the fee. And, uh, you know, they prefer that, but they can't legally keep his items um, and charge him a fee for that. So I, I, I would, I would suggest, and, and let, you know, certainly email me if, if you do that and you have trouble with that, um, because that's a larger systemic issue that shouldn't be happening. And um, yeah. And, and it'd be good to keep track of these types of, of things as a sector too, so that when they do these consultations or, you know, we can maybe, you know, send group complaints or something because that, I don't think that should be happening, but I feel the, the bailiff world is, is very gray. And what becomes really tricky is the bailiffs are governed by several pieces of late legislation. So we have the court enforcement act. There's like the warehouse liens act. There's, oh my goodness, there's a ton of different pieces of legislation that govern storage of items. And it gets, it gets, it can be really, really complicated. Um, so yeah, but if, if you don't mind, that'd be, um, great if you could keep me posted on if you were told something different because then you know could always be like well why are some of us getting inconsistent information and and the other thing that doesn't make sense to me is when I when I first raised this with um Peter Hamilton I said my client's property was seized why can't he claim this exemption because his property was seized and the response I got was it wasn't seized I was like, but it was, <laughs> it was taken. So I don't know how you're telling me it wasn't seized, how it being taken for storage is different from being taken from for, for the purposes of sale, because at the end of the day, it was still taken. And even if it's being taken for storage and you're not gonna charge, you know, try to sell the items, shouldn't they still be allowed to keep necessary clothing? So that still is unclear to me. Um, it's, it's again, I don't know if anyone else has any insights or any other experience, but yeah, I was told, oh no, it wasn't seized. And I was just like, I, I, please explain to me how this isn't a seizure of belongings, even though it's for safe storage. But um, okay, so the other thing about the exemption that's important to note is corpulists are supposed to provide the tenant the opportunity to claim their exemptions when they first attend the home. I've heard from many tenants saying, no, they never gave me that. They never mentioned it at all. Um, and a tenant must claim the exemptions within two days after the seizure of their belongings or notice of it, whichever is later of the date they found out their belongings were seized. So even if they didn't know they could claim those exemptions at the time, they only have about two days to act on that. So um, they're not given a lot of time to actually um, claim those exemptions. So yeah, this is the slide. Basically, I, I jumped ahead and I told you the story of my client and this distinction between seizing for safe storage versus seizing for the sale of items. Um, yeah, and so again, unclear how taking exempted belongings does not amount to a forced seizure. Um, and tenants must, as I mentioned, retrieve their belongings all at once. So I already kind of went over that with you all. Can a court bailiff charge the tenant fee? So the landlord pays the court bailiff fees. However, the landlord, as I mentioned, can apply for the RTB for dispute resolution to recover their costs. Storage facility cannot charge a fee. So again, that story uh, was probably premature in the presentation. Yeah, so I already went over that with you all. Um, okay, this is this is also interesting. So this was this is a provincial court case where a landlord tried to recover their fees for, I believe, the storage. So provincial court here says, um, I find the bailiff's costs were unnecessary and fortunate and dismissed the claim to recover the bailiff costs. To win an argument in a civil court is one thing. To gloat about it is quite another. But eagerness to inflict hardship has every appearance of vindictiveness. Had the landlord, despite whatever he thought was aggravation or provocation, been able to extend a simple courtesy to the tenants and talk to them, if not in person, at least through counsel, he would have learned that the tenants understood their remedies had been exhausted and that they had signed a, a rental agreement for another property. So um, the facts of, of this case were a uh, situation where basically like the ten the tenants communicated, hey, yeah, no, we're we're leaving, we're gonna move. You don't need a bailiff. Like there was no need for a bailiff. It was very clear. They had a new place, they had already made arrangements to move, but the landlord still 
called a bailiff. So um, I think this case is interesting because it basically tells us if a bailiff's unnecessary, you might not be able to recover your costs. And if it's clear to you that the tenant is moving and they've made all the arrangements to move and they're moving and you hired a bailiff, that has more of an appearance of vindictiveness than actual utility. So you might not be entitled to your costs if you called the bailiff unnecessarily as a way to, you know, actually just be vindictive. So I thought it was an interesting, interesting case. Uh, and then the court, another quote here, since the bailiff's expenses were unnecessary, the one portion of the counter can't claim for loss and damaged goods as a result of the goods packed and moved by the bailiff's that was allowed. So there was a counterclaim here where the tenants also made, um, made a claim for uh, damage to their goods as well. So they got their, um, they got a portion of their counterclaim in this case as well. So what can a tenant do if their belongings are damaged or stolen while the while in the bailiff's care? So tenants are first expected to try to resolve it with the company. And if you can't reach an agreement with the company, you can report your concerns to the, this is his title, Contract Administrative of the court bailiff program. So Peter Hamilton, and here's his, here's his email address. So this is who I've emailed to um, make these complaints about bailiffs, uh, including the the case I, I just told you where my client was told he had to pay a storage fee. And it was Peter Hamilton who told me, no, <laughs> that's their preference, but he doesn't have to. So um, that's there for you if you ever need it. It's also on, on the government website as well. And um, yeah, he's pretty, he's pretty responsive. He's pretty quick to respond to me. I mean, um, I don't know if that's always the case, but uh, my experience with, with him has been he, he's, he's responsive. He, he gets back to you pretty quickly. Okay, yeah, and this, this, as I mentioned already, a tenant can obtain a stay on the writ of possession, even if the bailiff has already removed the belonging. So that was, actually, here's the case. So this is the case, uh, Odette's case that I mentioned. So I thought I had it in here. And then for some reason, I thought I took it out. But so Goodman and Pavlovic, and it's a uh, recent 2021. So this is the case that um, Odette, the lawyer from Kamloops E. Fry, uh, Odette Dempsey Caputo, um, assist a client with where she was literally getting the stay on the writ as the bailiff was removing the belonging. So this is it. And this is, I think, the re really important, the relevant portion of, of the decision um, where the court says, I have also taken into account the conduct of the landlord and his agent, the bailiff. The bailiff should have paused his removal efforts when he learned a court order had been granted staying the order of possession. Instead, the bailiff sped up his efforts to evict the petitioners in an effort to thwart the order. This conduct cannot be encouraged. That's a part that I missed. Um, I believe, if I'm getting the facts correct here, that once the bailiff and landlord knew that the tenant's lawyer was in the process of getting the stay on the writ, they actually hired more people to come to make it faster, to make the whole process faster before Odette, um, again, I'm not sure if it was Odette who provided representation or someone else from the EFRI office, but before the tenant's lawyer even got there. So they made these efforts to actually try to speed it up um, so that they could finish before the tenant's lawyer got there with the stay. So uh, here we have the judge discouraging that type of behavior. And so this is this is this is the end. And I don't spend a lot of time on this. It's just something I wanted to note. Um, you know, certainly this is not my area of expertise. Um, and I actually got this from a really great guide that Pivot puts out. It's called Know Your Rights, a guide for people who rely on public space. Um, it's really, really good. And, you know, certainly I think Pivot has expertise in this area. Um, some of you ha may have more expertise in this area. I just wanted to reproduce this portion of that guide because also we have seizures of belongings by police. So although this uh, presentation was really focused on housing under the RTA, um, I just thought it was important to note here, you know, that there's also different types of seizures from different actors, inclu including police. And so when can police seize belongings? And so um, pursuant to four, section 489, subsection two of the criminal code, police should only seize property if it is connected to a crime, was obtained by the commission of an offense, was used in the commission of an offense, or will give evidence in relation to an offense. Now, I didn't put anything here about bylaw officers because we know that bylaw officers um, sometimes also seize property, but 
just something again to to keep to be mindful of um you know the different actors who seize the property of people and again i think this know your rights guide um is a really great guide that that really explains a lot of the rights of folks who are houseless um have so i would definitely recommend if you don't already have a copy of that guide to get that guide and if you are assisting clients who are encountering um, the seizure of belongings by the police that, you know, perhaps following up with Pivot or um, other folks with expertise in that area. So, oh yeah, okay. So I thought that was the last side. So illegally property owned, so that type of property can be destroyed and may not be returned. Lawfully owned property they can take. They rarely provide paperwork when seizing belongings. They may have parties sign a waiver called a waiver of voluntary relinquishment, and the police may threaten a party with arrest if they do not sign the waiver. So it's a waiver they don't have to sign, but they will use intimidation tactics and get people to sign that waiver. And if property is seized and no charges are laid, uh, a tenant can try to call the local police property office and ask them to return their property. The sense I got was it's very hard to get the police to return a person's property if they've if they've seized lawfully owned property. But again, um, this guide is, is really good. I highly recommend getting a copy of it. And, and that is it. So my apologies. I was hoping to have a little more time left over for questions, but we still have four minutes and I'm happy to go a little bit over if, of, if people have questions that um, will take us past three. Thank you, Danielle. Um, it's really interesting. I have put up um, the pivot document that you were talking about and something um, mentioned in the chat from TAPS. So those are both up there and then we'll okay. follow up with cases. Um, Okay, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or, or